Pues uh, nada, bienvenidos a, a todas a este, a este panel titulado Culturas de lo visual, imagen y colonialismo. Eh, yo soy Alba Valenciano Mañé y voy a hablar eh, en nombre de, también de Francesca Baire, que lamentablemente no ha podido estar aquí uh, hoy por problemas, por cuestiones ajenas a, a su voluntad. Eh, sí hemos podido leer las tres intervenciones que, que oiréis y la, hemos hablado y hemos preparado un poco de, de, de un, una pequeña reflexión que, que leeré al final de, de las intervenciones. Intervenciones que eh, nos van a hablar de, de imágenes del siglo coloniales, del siglo XIX y también de, de, en el siglo, de, de imágenes del siglo XX. Va a empezar Jürg Schneider, que nos va a presentar una ponencia titula, titulada Visual Arguments of Success and Claim, The Spanish Colonial Power and the English Missions in Fernando Po in the late 19th century. Luego nos va a hablar Inés Plasencia, eh, con, una, con una ponencia titulada Entonces, ahora y en los márgenes, la fotografía como conocimiento y la cultura visual como método en el estudio del colonialismo español en Guinea. Y finalmente nos hablará Hassan López Sanz con una ponencia titulada Cuerpos estáticos en espacios significados, el guineano como curiosidad exótica en las ferias del muestrario de Valencia 1942-1948. Y sin más, os dejo con Jürg. Muchas gracias um, por la invitación eh, para organizar es, este seminario. Sí. Uh, I will talk and present in English because my Spanish is very poor. Hope you can follow. Um, I'm very happy that, um, among others, I recognize my colleague Miguel Milano, Miguel, and uh, Señor Sundiata in the audience. So I'm very happy to have these people here. The others, of course, very welcome. Uh, you, you know, uh, the colonial history of Fernando Po, now Bioko, in the 19th century is extremely complex and marked on the one hand by Spain's inconsistent claim to the island and on the other hand equally unstable by the actual administration by English consuls. This changeable state of aspirations for domination and actual rule had a parallel on the level of religious denominations. Protestant and Catholic missions at times coexisted, but at other times, the Catholic Church, promoted by the Spanish colonial power, tried to sideline Protestant missions, although with questionable success. In the end, it was a battle <coughs> for souls. In the case of, Spanish, of the Spanish, for reasons of political dominance and cultural hegemony, and in the case of the Protestants, at least on Fernando Po, with less political impetus to free Africans from paganism and bring them to the kingdom of God. An, an analysis of photographs from the 1860s and 1870s from Fernando Po will try to unravel how the Protestant missions and the Spanish colonial state used photographs to support their respective claims and the right or justification to be there. These images will also bring us closer to an African woman, Elizabeth Job, for whom the Protestant mission not only meant a spiritual and emotional home, but also offered a degree of independence that the Catholic mission and in consequence the Spanish colonial state was not willing to grant. The story unfolds in the apron of the Berlin Conference in the early 1880s, when, as Ibrahim Sundiata put it, the rhythm of Spanish activity in West Africa was out of sync with that of other colonial powers. In the early 1870s, the Spanish government decided on retrenchment of the budget for the colony. In 72, the buildings and storehouses of the government were sold, 
except for the Catholic mission. This prompted the then governor, Diego Santisteban, a delegate of the newly installed Cabinet of the Restorations, of the Restoration, to send a report to Madrid which stressed the great benefit Spain could gain from, the ne from its neglected and practically unknown colony. In order to support his argument, he sent 14 photographs from Fernando Po to Madrid that were the bare visual evidence of the Spanish possessions wealth and its inhabitants' interest in the economic development of the island. There's more detail in the article I wrote together with my colleague, Miguel Vilaro y Guel. We shall return to this point and these photographs, but let me first draw the rough lines of the history of missionary work on Fernando Po. Although a Spanish possession since the 18th century, it was only in 1843 that Juan José Lerena took formal possession of the colony and appointed the British trader and explorer John, John Beecroft governor. And only in 1858, the government of Madrid decided to send a real expedition of occupation under the command of Captain Carlos Chacon, who would be its first Spanish governor. The first Spanish missionaries had arrived in 1845. They became ill and left. In 1856, Padre Miguel Martinez y Sanz arrived together with 31 religious and lay workers. Again, this attempt proved to be short-lived, not least because they did not speak English, the language spoken by the Fernandinos. A year prior to the arrival of the first Spanish missionaries, Baptist missionaries had settled on Fernando Po. The Baptist's arrival represented the long echo of a pietist movement that had set in in the late 18th century with the foundation of a number of Protestant mission societies. They had just organized themselves for the missions and Africa was clearly in their sights. In 1858, however, after Chacon's arrival, the Baptists had to leave Fernando Po, and the Jesuits took their place. After 13 years' labor, they gave up the mission. Fernandian Protestants had represented a major obstacle for the success of the Jesuit mission in Fernando Po, because they refused to send their children to the missionaries' schools of Santa, Santa Isabel. But everything changed in the following years when Germany, France, and Great Britain began to expand into the area, wielding its supposed rights derived from the Treaty of El Pardo. The government of Madrid became interested again in the Guinean colony and in 1883 sent a new mission, this time of the Claritans, to the, to the disputed territories that Spain claimed. On February 21, 1870, 12 years after the departure of the Baptists and two years before the, that of the Jesuits, two couples of the primitive Methodist Mission Society Reverend and Mrs. Burnett and their little son Willie, and Henry and Mrs. Rowe, who was heavily pregnant, landed on the shores of Fernando Po. Two Africans, so I quote what uh, Henry Rowe reported in one of his books, two Africans dressed neatly as Europeans, spring lightly on deck and shake hands as though we were the dearest friends in all the world. Oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. We have waited long time for missionary, and now, thank God, you are come. In an earlier account describing the same scene, Henry Rowe wrote, among the first to grasp our hands and speak kind words is a tall, nobly built woman above the middle age, 
whose sable face shines brighter for the silvery curly hair. You see, England, English poetry in the 19th century. What the palm is in the forest and the warrior chieftain is to the band, this African princess is to many of her race in Fernando Po. We have heard her spoken of as the Lady High Priestess, but she will, better know, she will be better known to our readers as Mama Job. Fernando, Fernandino women were important pillars of the primitive Methodist mission endeavor. And it was even a Spanish missionary who in the early 1880s contended that it was the women who sustained the Protestant mission. It was in the house of Mama Nichols, another mama, where the first missionaries were put up after their arrival. And it was in the house of Mama Job, Elizabeth Job, where the first preaching service was held in the evening of the Methodists' arrival. Nathaniel Bucock, who spent three years on Fernando Po, readily acknowledged the importance of good and useful women and worthy sisters such as Mammies, Macaulay, Smith, Samuels, Barber, etc. You will recognize these are all British names, so it's people who arrived, who were settled uh, on Fernando Po. But Mamab Job received the highest praise and recognition, both from Bukok and Henry Rowe. And today she can even be found on the website of the Primitive Methodist Mission mentioned in the category influential lay people as one of the few women and the only African. No history of Fernando Po, wrote Bukok, would be complete without reference to Mama Job. In many respects, she was one of the most remarkable persons I ever knew, he says. Being a woman of strong individuality, she wielded extraordinary power among the natives of the town. And as if words alone would not suffice, Bukok had the cover of his book, Our Fernandian Mission, adorned with Mama Job's portrait. This is the book and this is the portrait of Mama Job. In fact, this is not the only image we know since several other portraits of Elizabeth Job have survived in various British collections. Elizabeth Job's visibility and words and images is indeed remarkable. And the question then, which we, and this is in fact the question which we will try to answer in the following section. Why Elizabeth Job has achieved such unusual written and visual prominence. Henry Rowe's wife dedicated a lengthy paragraph to the life of Elizabeth, of Elizabeth Job, born of African royalty and an ethnic Igbo from Nigeria. She was captured as a child and embarked on board a slave ship bound to a foreign land. But the slaver was detected by a British anti-slavery squadron and the 700 slaves were landed at Fernando Po and set free. It is difficult to say how old she was when she first met the primitive mission, uh, Methodists. Henry Rowe mentioned her gray hair and wrote that she was in her 90s when she died in 1896. If indeed she was born shortly after 1800 and was captured as a child or adolescent, she must have been among the first freed slaves settled on Fernando, on Fernando Po in the late 1820s or early 30s. Therefore, in 1870, she must have been in her 60s. Now, the earliest photograph of her we know, probably from the late 1860s, is a carte de visite which is part of the John Holt. John Holt was a trader in Fernando Po of the John Holt estate at Liverpool Central Library. That's the carte de visite. There remain, however, certain doubts whether this is really Elizabeth Job, but the inscription on the back, which reads Miss Betsy Top. Betsy is Elizabeth, that's fine, but Top and Job, well could be well mis misspelled. 
Grateful to the British for her liberation, young, separated from her family, although not from her ethnic group, and with no ties to the autochton booby, we can understand that she accepted Christianity, that is Protestant baptism, like many other freed slaves, as her spiritual home. And we can just as well understand that she was skeptical about, if not outright in silent opposition, to the colonization by the Spanish and their attempt to Hispanize and <coughs> Catholicize. Essentially, for all Fernandinos who economically and culturally were turned toward British West Africa, the new colonial order with the Catholic mission and the military as its foundational columns posed a challenge. However, the collusion between colonization and evangelization in Fernando Po was especially harsh on women. The space, for Catholic, the, the space the Catholic Church allocated African women was very limited, in particular compared with what the, what the Protestant missions offered, and this gradually led to the exclusion of women from public space. Furthermore, with the arrival of Chacon began a long and continuous conflict over the schooling of children which the Spanish tried to impose exclusively, exclusively being in their language. In this conflictual context, Mama Job was not only a palm in the forest who remained loyal to the Protestants until her death, but also an integrative personality and a rock in the stormy sea. Her extraordinary personality and key position in the Fernandino community assured her prominent, a prominent place in the mission's written and visual history. There are, apart from the portrait on Bukok's book and the carte de visite, you can see here, two other photographs that testimony the privileged place she enjoyed. So this is a photograph. Mama Job is sitting between the two uh, Methodist missionaries, Holland. And this is a photograph of an unknown photography, which is today in the Methodist archives. So it's quite extraordinary to have four photographs of an African woman as a person. What considerably contributed to her fame was the fact that she had been among those who had kept the Protestant faith alive after the Baptists' departure until the arrival of the Methodists, 12 years. It was in the house of Elizabeth Job, Henry Rowe proudly noted, where after the Baptists were expelled from the country, the few surviving Christians met to sigh and pray in silence. Ibrahim Sundiata confirms that after 1858, in spite of its reluctance to abandon its home and follow the Baptists to Cameroon, the Clarence Santa Isabel community re remained Protestant in its sympathies and many African Protestants conducted their own religious services and literacy classes. Such stories are of course a topos of Christian and missionary history native Christians who hold up faith in dark times until the white missionaries come back and take over again. So there's a similar story in Cameroon with Modi Dean, uh, a native uh, pastor. Now mission societies were very aware of the power of the image and used photographs quite quickly after its invention as a means to document their work overseas and seek support to the metropole. The primitive Methodists did not possess cameras themselves, but relied on the, uh, on the services of an African photographer, Francis W. Joac, who hailed from Sierra Leone, worked in Fernando Po, and later also in Libreville in Gabon. Now, two instances covering the period from 1860 to 1872 will show how the Spanish 
in Fernando Po used photograph photography for the promotion of Spain's only sub-Saharan possession in the metropole. But we will notice some differences to the Protestant photographs. The Spaniard José Muñoz y Gaviria, the Visconde de San Javier, as Administrador General de Rentas en las Posesiones Españoles en el Golfo de Guinea, beautiful, <laughs> spent three years from 1860 to 1863 on Fernando Po. A photo album which contains 24 photographs from Fernando Po on the island of Corisco, taken by himself or a member of his entourage, showing buildings, native people and scenery, bears witness to the Spanish officers' attempt to promote Spain's sub-Saharan possessions in the metropole. So this is one photograph from, from that album. It's actually it's the first photograph of the Catholic Church, taken in 1962. In Some third, uh, 15 years later, in 1870. Five, Diego Santisteban, the first governor appointed by the government of the Bourbon Restoration, sent forth in views of the capital Santa, of the capital buildings and inhabitants to the Navy Department with the purpose of giving his super, superior el más exacto conocimiento de lo que es esta localidad tan olvidada y digna de mejor suerte en la parte que se relaciona con los intereses materiales tan en decadencia hoy por falta de recursos. These photographs were taken by Francis W. Joac, the same photographer who had also worked for the primitive Methodists. One motif that appears in both collections, in the Viscondes, the Santi Sebastian, Santi Esteban, um, so one motif that appears in these two collections, as well as in the photo album that belonged to the British trader John Holt, is the Catholic Church of Santa Isabel. It was the first building in Santa Isabel to be built entirely of brick. The foundation stone was laid in November 1861, so that was St. Isabel's Day, and it was officially opened exactly one year later. Now, the main reason I argue why this church features so prominently in various collections is not only its uniqueness and the fact that it, that it was for quite a while one of, the, one of the only two brick buildings in the capital, but because it was a landmark, a landmark that solidly and enduringly united and represented the two pillars of Spanish colonialism, the government, military, and the clergy. So this is the Catholic Church from the John Holt album. This is Francis Schwarz's photograph from the same church. Mm -hmm. So this, I have to go back quickly. So I'm talk, I was talking about the landmark, about how important this built um, brick um, building was, because it was a sign of of of, um, of the Spanish colonial administration in one part because um, of the because it represented the government military and the clergy, and this was made even more evident when the photograph showed. The both of them, after the service, united in front of the church. So you, can, you will recognize this one is the governor, so the clergy and the, the church is in the back. How different then was what the Protestants could offer with regard to a solid building structure? Yes. In the 1870s, Protestants were not permitted to worship in buildings which looked like churches or which had any tablets or boards on them or near them to indicate that services were held there. Furthermore, 
they were told not to ring the bell or even remove it. However, later on, a wooden church featuring a tower and a spire would be opened, which gave place to a more substantial iron church, lecture hall, and vestries in 1894. Thus, the Protestants had what the Catholics did not have, <coughs> a community of devout followers who remained faithful and carried on even when the mission was absent. In this perspective, people were much more important than the built substance of the Catholics, which, in Henry Rowe's words, did not even represent the Christianity, but the idolatry of Europe. Elizabeth Job served, at, served the primitive Methodist mission as noble's example of unshakable faith, as proof of what the Protestant mission was able to achieve in Africa. In her very essence, in a context of fierce scramble for souls and bodies, at least the way she was represented and remembered by the Methodists, she symbolized the superiority of the Protestants over the Catholic faith. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Thank you.